very definition that not to say too much, but uh, that's okay uh, if you consider the fact that uh, every application is different. And uh, furthermore, every application uh, development process is uh, different. So let's start first with uh, development uh, workflow. So uh, what are some basic building elements of uh, application development workflow? So first, you should uh, have your environment set up. Then, of course, you develop, build, deploy. After that, you monitor your uh, application behavior, and uh, the circle goes around. So, what should you do about your uh, environment? How should you set up? Some uh, minimum requirement would be to have at least a development and production environment, unless, of course, you want to uh, develop direction and production, which I guess you know. Uh, but you can do uh, better than this, so you should have at least some staging environment in between where you would uh, deploy your code before it hits the production. So that way uh, you can easily uh, detect failures uh, in some early stages where it is not that, uh, that uh, dangerous. Uh, in this case, uh, we are going to assume some other uh, environment as well, uh, particular testing and uh, Production. But uh, regardless how many environments you have, uh, all of them should be as similar as possible. So uh, the best practice would be to have some kind of a golden image, uh, which uh, would be used uh, throughout all of uh, your environment. So there are really good, uh, uh, very good tools that uh, help you build uh, images like this. Uh, for example, Packer.io is such a tool. Uh, you can build uh, images for different machine types from uh, Docker, VMware, uh, Bearboom, Apple, AWS, uh, you name it. So uh, you should definitely make use of that. Uh, also, at the uh, present time, containers are pretty popular, so uh, in particular, uh, Docker, we will, we will use uh, Docker in, uh, in this uh, uh, session uh, demo. Uh, so uh, we will use Docker to test uh, to test uh, application that is in some early stages of, uh, of uh, development. So that would be uh, about uh, environments. But how should your exact Developing workflow look like my colleague. Right, so uh, we are talking, we are planning to talk about the exact development workflow and how we are doing so, but not before that, let's try to cover some of the most known patterns out there. So basically, probably when you see those names, uh, most of you are probably using the same approach, okay, if not name the same, then some modification which is based on it. But let's start with the git flow, and I don't plan the main tricks you because there is no official git flow, so... One here is the git flow presented by this and reason back in 2010, and from the beginning it was accepted very well, uh, just because of the flexibility it provides. So, how this git flow works? So basically, when you initialize the repository at the same moment, you're also creating a developer branch. And then, whenever you are developing some feature, you are creating a feature branch. And there comes that flexibility and parallelization, which this flow allows you, because you can easily switch from one feature branch to another. One of the feature is ready, you are simply merging it back to the developer branch. And then you are ready for the releasing, you check out the release branch, and at some point, when you are ready to go live, you simply merge the release branch into the master branch. And what is happening when there are some urgent cases of bug fixes which you need to fix and so on. So basically, you 
simply create the, the hot mix branch, apply the mixes there, and then where to back into the master branch and then down into the cloud branch. So this <laughs> maybe seems you know, a bit more complicated, but at the very end it's very flexible. This one, GitHub flow, is maybe the simplest one I've seen so far. So basically you only have the master branch that's that includes the client and the feature branch. And once you're ready, your feature, you're merging it back into the master branch. But this flow assumes that you're able to deploy every time the feature branch is ready to be merged. But that's not always the case. So imagine a situation where you need to validate something. So you cannot deploy it in production or if there are some deployment windows. So in those cases, this flow will not be suitable for you. So basically, when, whenever, so or when you're not in a control of the exact release moment, you should think about using the GitHub flow, which is basically pretty the same as one extension to the production branch. So basically, whenever you need to see what's the status on a production, which code base is there, you will simply check out the production branch and see, okay, this is its point. Now that we have those three here, so maybe, or how we could describe them, for example, in a single sentence for each of them. So, the git flow is usable for when releases are preferable, so you will then choose to use the git flow. If you are able to deploy every time the feature branch is merged, you can easily use the git flow, which is a really simple one. And at the very end, you can go with the GitLab and you can always know what the things on the production. The main question, how we do it? So, we applied some modifications and when you see the signature, you probably think, okay, this is a GitLab, but actually it isn't. So, we removed or we never introduced the developer branch to this model, so basically, everything that we are doing are doing on the master branch. And we kept the flexibility, so you have the feature branches, you are able to work in parallel and so on. But at the time when we are ready for, for, for deployment, we are checking out the release branch. So the release branch in this case, you can think about as some kind of a snapshot of the master branch in a certain point of time. And we also kept the hotfixes scenario for the git flow, so if there are some hotfixes, you will apply that through the release branch and back to the master branch. But as you can see on this scenario, we are not allowing any changes except the hotfixes of the release branch. Continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So we cannot talk about the development workflow and not to mention the in the main part of continuous delivery. So usually when you read some articles, you simply see a CD. But what is a CD? Is it continuous delivery or it's something simply a deployment? So you're not aware you need to go really deep into the topic and to be aware of what's the difference and what the author wanted to say with that CD. So how many of you know what is continuous delivery? Okay. Oh, okay. So Let's try to explain this. So, continuous <coughs> delivery by Martin Power. So, it says it's a development discipline which allows you that you build the software in a such a way that it can be releasable to production at any time. So, whatever you do, whenever you have some changes on your code, you should be pretty sure that that can go live and not causing you some kind of a problem. So there is a ThoughtWorks working group where by the Martin is the chief scientist and they defined four items which needs to be fulfilled if you want to say okay I'm doing continuous delivery or we are doing continuous delivery. So basically what would be for them? It means that you deploy that your software is deployable through its life cycles and that you have the automated feedback, so for every step you get the feedback and that you can deploy it just clicking on a button, so everything is ready, you click on a button and it's deployed to production and the 
besides that, it's also that you're always prioritize working on a deployable of your software over the working on new features. So you always need to be sure that your software, if you end up to production values very soon, will not cause any damage to you. So, what are the benefits? If there are no benefits, most probably you will not use the continuous delivery. So, the first would be maybe a reduced deployment risk. So, why it's reduced? Because you have smaller changes and the last can go wrong, and it's much pretty easier to fix that. The second one could be some kind of of a real progress, of a believable progress, so you are not just marking your items in a GitLab or a deep market on it, this issue is done. That's not the case, because you're sure that this feature will be on a production in a very, very short period of time. And when, it, when at the very end, you have the, the, the really valuable, maybe the most of them, the user feedback. So whenever you're developing something and you're pushing that forward, it will reach your users very soon. So if something is going wrong, not only in the code base or code perspective or something like that, something is failing, but as well if something is going wrong in your idea, so you're trying to make some workflow for the user which is not suitable, you will get a really fast feedback and you will be able to simply change the way you're going on. Now when you know this, you can simply say that continuous delivery ensures that every change to the application is releasable. And that's it. Now let's see what continuous deployment is. Basically, the continuous deployment is based on a continuous delivery, but instead of that button which I mentioned before, that you click on a button and it's deployed, you have a situation that that change is automatically deployed to production. But there is a big if. So, if the acceptance test has passed, I always say so. If you, I mean, you can skip the acceptance test, but then it will not automatically lead to production, it will lead to some kind of disaster. So, keep in mind that. And there is really a nice image which I took from the sub blog, so I saw that while I was preparing this uh, slides, that it's heavily used. So, basically, only the last step is a different one. And you should be always aware that continuous deployment cannot exist without continuous delivery. So it's just kind of an extension. It's the same as, as continuous delivery cannot exist without continuous integration, but we're not going to talk about it now. And there is one really good tweet which I saw. So basically, it was repeated several hundred times, and it's really trying to, to explain what, what continuous delivery is. And if you simply negotiate that, you will get the continuous deployment. But there is one crucial thing at the end, just to mention. So, no matter how good uh, you are with your requirements for the continuous deployment and so on, you cannot use it just like that. If there are some validations which need to be passed by someone else, or if there is any kind of human interaction, you're not doing continuous deployment. It's not possible. But even then, you need to be aware that it's not only enough that you deploy your post to production. So it means that if there are any changes on the database or something like that, your database migrations should go automatically there. And how many of you are ready to do that? It's a real question. So it's a topic which we are going to cover a bit later. So, yeah. Great. So let's see what are some basic uh, principles that every deployment process should follow. Uh, we said already that uh, every application is uh, unique and probably every team has uh, its own approach, but uh, these are some uh, basic principles and rules that uh, every deployment uh, process should follow. So the key point is automation. Uh, Automate as much as possible. Whatever you can automate, just do it. Why is that? Uh, well, less human interaction. Of course, whenever you have a human interaction, there's a great chance that something will go wrong. Computers do things much better than we do. 
also they do it much faster. Uh, yeah, you don't need uh, uh, you, you don't need high experience people to uh, to deploy uh, your uh, your code. Uh, your deployments are repeatable, meaning that whenever you repeat, whenever you redeploy the same build, the outcome should be the same and will be the same if things are uh, automated. Uh, and also, if uh, you, yeah, of course, you will learn through time, so you cannot predict all the possible scenarios uh, from the very beginning. But uh, if you uh, implement this, uh, 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 this, this, uh, well, let's call the problems that you uh, stumble upon through time. If you implement them uh, into your uh, uh, deployment script. Then, after uh, some time, you will get uh, a robust uh, uh, deployment script that, that will be uh, able to handle uh, most of the cases that, that, uh, that you might uh, have. And uh, yeah, it goes without saying that uh, uh, automation uh, saves a lot of time and thus reduces overall expenses. Next, five bars. So what are five bars? There's a really uh, good article by James Patrick and Dipat on Bison.com and uh, there he uh, gives a definition of this five R's uh, mnemonic. So uh, first R uh, is rapid. So you should keep your deployment as fast as possible. You, sh you shouldn't uh, do anything that is not really necessary for that process. Uh, like for example, when you do your build, uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, you shouldn't include things that are required only for development. And uh, uh, you could also you should also minify your assets like uh, uh, JavaScript and uh, CSS. Uh, next, reliable. Well, we already talked about. Uh, reliability when we talked about automation just a moment ago. So uh, it means that uh, you uh, will detect your uh, failures uh, much earlier. So if you use the same process uh, with uh, uh, for, for uh, all, all the environment that you have, then uh, probably if there is a problem, you will detect it before it hits the production. So that's uh, one of the one of the benefits of uh, of automated uh, deployment. Repeatable. What does it mean? So uh, when you repeat the same, uh, when you redeploy the same build, you should always have this, the same outcome. Uh, meaning that if you change your deployment script and uh, it uh, gives you a different uh, different build, then it's not the same version anymore. So probably the good idea is to keep your uh, deployment scripts together with your application and to version it, to have track of all the changes that, uh, that, that you made to it. Uh, repeatable, that's, uh, yeah, sorry. points to your current build, 
when your uh, build that you are going to deploy is finished, you simply re relink uh, to, to it, and you that way you have uh, so-called automatic, uh, sorry, uh, atomic deployment. What does it mean? So it means that you uh, deploy your actually you publish your uh, release with a simple atomic switch. There are some problems with that we uh, had that experience, uh, like for example, uh, if you switch uh, to the new build and uh, uh, all the cache, uh, cache your files, then you have to uh, clear this cache, you cannot do it by uh, uh, you can not do it any, any other way than uh, reloading your uh, web server. So then it's not uh, it's not uh, atomic anymore. But yeah, those are some uh, problems uh, that uh, we will not uh, cover in, in, in this session. Uh, also, when we talk about uh, rollback, uh, if you have some kind of uh, migrations, some kind of changes to your database, uh, were they uh, that migrations so that you can roll uh, them back as well? Well, it depends. If you pay attention to that, then uh, they might be. So uh, you should uh, have your migrations backward compatible. What does it mean? So. Uh, you shouldn't have destructive operations. So if you have any kind of destructive operations, there will be, you, you cannot uh, just uh, roll back that. That's, that goes without saying. So let's see in this example what's wrong with this picture. So uh, we have a migration. This is blockchain generated migration. Uh, we have a migration for a uh, simple add of uh, new column to a table uh, and we have a down migration that just drops this column. Well, if you uh, executed this migration, chances are that uh, this newly added column uh, already has some data. If you just simply drop uh, this column, you will lose the data. So this is not uh, a migration that is uh, uh, backward compatible. So uh, probably this down migration should uh, uh, should just uh, not do any any job or anything. Uh, and this uh, up migration should have some kind of check if this. Uh, this column already exists. That way, you would make it uh, backward compatible, and then you could think about uh, rollback and, uh, furthermore, uh, about automation of uh, database migrations. But even if you have uh, this kind of uh, this kind of migrations, if uh, you are disciplined enough uh, to check every migration. Probably it would be a good idea to have some kind of uh, check built in your uh, deployment uh, process that will at least check for some uh, suspicious, <coughs> suspicious keywords, like for example, if it finds a drop, that's always something that uh, that's uh, suspicious, and that well, at that point you should probably stop. Okay, how to treat configuration? Well, uh, parameters, configuration parameters are probably different for each environment that we have. And uh, your application, of course, is uh, uh, able to distinguish on which environment it is running. So that's easily achievable by, by using refinement uh, variables. Uh, and uh, everything is fine, except if you have some uh, things that you don't want to expose to everyone who has access to your uh, repository, to your code. So if you trust all of, all of your 
developers or all the people that can access uh, your code, then it's fine. Then you can keep your uh, credentials uh, inside of inside of your repository. But uh, if that's not the case, what should you do then? So uh, one idea would be to have uh, this secret handle somehow uh, separately. The, 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 the simplest, uh, simplest uh, way to do that is uh, to uh, tokenize your, uh, your uh, parameters. Uh, so that tokens are visible to everybody. But then you know during the deployment process uh, how should you replace it, these tokens with uh, uh, actual, actual parameters which you will keep somehow separately. So, uh, uh, simple idea as keeping, keeping it in a separate uh, each repository, for example, will just uh, do, do fine. Uh, we will see later, we will have a, a short demo, so we will see how uh, that uh, can be handled. So, that's pretty much uh, about uh, these uh, basic principles. Now, uh, let's see what are some available tools and all libraries that will help you uh, organize your deployment. Okay, so we went through the environments, through the development process, now through deployment principles, uh, we are very close to our demo. But before that, let's try to, to cover these issues here, or those topics here. So, libraries and tools, so we are all using them or any kind of operations. And while the libraries are mainly considered as some kind of task runner, so we have some list of defined tasks and we are doing some operations there. The tools are pretty wider from that point. And especially lately, the, the tools are trying to cover the complete process from development to deployment. So basically, now you have most of them are supporting the pipelines, or they are integrated in CI runners, and so on and so on. But from our own experience, usually, when you take the, the bolt, the synergy of both, the combination of both, you get the best possible results. So, simply, when you establish communication between those tools, between those two tools and libraries, you can fully customize the process of the way how you like it. So basically, in this case, how, how you would establish the communication? Usually, almost all the tools are having the API in front of them, so you can easily involve the API requests and save on some actions. So basically, from some task, you can poke the API of the tool and send some signal there for something to be done. On the other hand, when there is some action or some event happens, no matter if it's just a Human event, or it is some automatically event using the webhooks, which tools are supporting, you are simply now going back and you can catch or, uh, catch or send a signal to some API which you built, so that's the API, no matter. And behind that API, you will again have your own tools there. So basically, you are having a full cycle of communication, and all of them can interact one to each other when that's required. So, <coughs> for this demo, we use the, the, the Robo library, and why we decided for that, I mean, we are not using this library in, in our own company, so we are using the different ones, but we, I mean, this is PHP Serbia, so this is the, the library which is completely written in PHP. Yeah. So, the Robo is a fast runner, and there are some predefined operations which they support for development, testing, deployment. And there are some of the uh, qualities of, of the robot, so you can find all of them and even more on the robot.py, so you can give it a try. We will show the demo based on this library now. So, what we are going to do, we are going to use robots to deploy the simple, simple application. And we are trying to cover the complete process now from feature implementation of the to reach the production environment. And how the process should go like 
you can see all this process diagram here. So basically we are starting with the creation of feature. So there is a feature branch created and at the exact same moment we will bring up the, the Docker containers. So we are trying to establish the review app. So how the review app works, basically you're having a, a, a Docker container, you can set up the V host or whatever, and the product team can easily access to your code base and see how you are developing your feature. So it's not that they access and see what are you typing there, but they can really test the feature. And once the feature is ready, we are simply sending the merge requests, which then is accepted. We are leading to the, to the clearing this feature, so we are bringing down the Docker containers, we are bringing up the memory, we are moving the branches, and so on. And those three first steps in this, in this process are basically, with those three, we are finishing the development part of the process. So, then we are entering into the deployment part of the processes, and what we are first starting, we are deploying to staging. We are pushing the code there, we are applying the database migrations, and afterwards, we are creating the release. When we are ready with the release, we can simply deploy it to reproduction, and if there are, or if there are not, some bug fixes to be, some testing, testing to be performed, we are continuing to the final step in the process, we are deploying it to production. So basically that would be the process, and we, will, and we are going to, to go through this demo, we will go through each of those, and show you how it works. Now, let's see the deployment diagram. So, Basically, this diagram also shows you some kind of like infrastructure, how the nodes are set up. So, the first part is going with the developer. So, each developer has set up its own environment, but we do not that recommend that something that it should be doing like that. So, my colleague Balash has mentioned before that you should try to keep and to have environments as similar as possible. So if you have some image built on a vagrant or some other tool, you can then bring it to the developer and basically he would feel like he is developing, that he is working in the exact same environment that it is on production. So there are much bigger chances, chances that you will catch the, the errors which happens there. Okay, there is simply not that you have the differences with PHP versions of, 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 of different environments and that's some error is not exposed to you, but it's exposed on a production, so deprecated functions and so on. So basically, when you are finished with development of the feature, you're going with deployment, and you're deployed to the staging. So here we have a staging host server with one component of Apache server, but whatever you want. And there is a special node which is uh, dedicated for the database, so database server waiting there for, for the connections and so on. So when we are doing the process of the deployment, we are applying the database operations to the database server. When everything is fine with the staging, we are continuing the deploy process to pre-production server. And what happens here? So when the code reaches the pre-production, we are applying the database migration, but directly to the production database. So what's, what's the point of it? So basically you are having the code which still didn't reach the production server, but you are able to, to test and see how it's going to behave with the real data. So with the real database which contains the same amount of data, you can measure the performance and so on and so on. So that's not always possible. Uh, there are some cases which you cannot seem to do that, but you know, we are trying to reduce that that to the minimum. And especially in this case, it's very important that you have the migrations which can hold down. Because if something is not okay, you will simply roll the back migrations down and go return the production state of these states to the to the wrong to, to the right one. So in the cases when you cannot for some reason do that, you will simply go and do the final two deployments at the same time. So you will go to pre-production and production with executing the database from that migration of the database of the production database server. So that's a bit risky, but it's reduced 
completely minimal and it's really high measures and we are going to work that so we can back up and so on. But as I said, it's really, really rare. So now we are going to, to start with the demo and I will just go switch back to this slide because we are going to switch the screens and cover this process here in the, in the tool. I'm just going to try to draw.
next, which means that uh, feature was accepted and merged into master. So uh, we do robo deploy uh, master to page. So there's a uh, 
all uh, your environment. So yes, that's, that's something that you have to take care of. So a uh, user that executes all these commands has uh, have to have uh, access to all, all machines that uh, are deployed. In that case, do you have some designated team member just for deploys or any other thing? Uh, well, uh, not everybody can do. Not everybody can do. So, uh, uh, users that uh, basically only users that have access to uh, to all of those machines can do that. Or if you go uh, if, uh, a step a step further, then you would uh, uh, you would uh, uh, you would use uh, some kind of interface like uh, Jenkins, for example. Or you would have uh, <coughs> API that listens uh, that listens to, uh, to to certain events and triggers this uh, these commands, and then uh, this machine, so a user on that machine would uh, also have to uh, have his, his keys deployed to all environments. Anyone else? Thank you guys very much.